Hi, I'm Joe Calamari here with Project Geospatial here at GeoInt 2024, and we have the pleasure of speaking with Enabled Intelligence today. We have Peter with us. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Peter Kant. I'm with Enabled Intelligence. I'm the CEO and the founder of the company. Uh, we started the company four years ago based on something that I was learning back. Uh, I started my career in the government a long time ago, but I've been at the nexus of technology uh, and national security for about 25 years. And a few, number of years ago, I was uh, leading a number of the federal programs at a place called the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI International, a large nonprofit R&D organization based in uh, Stanford, outside Palo Alto, with campuses around the world. And we were doing a lot of uh, intelligence analysis and AI development. So one of the things that came out of SRI was Siri. We invented Siri as a DARP project and sold it to Apple Computer. Um, a lot of imagery analysis and early AI. And one of the things that kept coming up in my work at SRI and then later on as I was CEO of an uh, Incutel uh, startup was the government really wanted to use a lot of these AI technologies and tools and new of these innovations, but at the basis of all of those tools is the need for high quality labeled and annotated data, whether it's geospatial imagery, radio frequencies, text, audio, whatever it may be. And there were no domestic suppliers or, or service providers of uh, labeling data. So you could send data overseas to the Philippines or China or Malaysia, but we weren't going to send our spy satellite imagery or our tax records or healthcare information overseas. And you needed a certain level of expertise to be able to do that. It's one thing to annotate stop signs like on CAPTCHA for an autonomous vehicle. It's a whole other thing to annotate. That's a Russian MiG-29 and synthetic aperture radar image in the wrong geo coordinate off Nader. You need a certain amount of expertise. Plus the critical nature of those programs, you know, if we annotate wrong for Google Maps, we may get lost. If we annotate wrong for the NGA or the US Air Force, there's a more critical uh, negative outcome for that. So uh, I was looking to start a company. We just uh, sold the last company and I was looking to do something. I really wanted to focus on this uh, mission area of national security. And uh, I was looking for, well, where can we find a workforce that's here in the U.S., U.S. citizens, that we can get cleared, and get clearances when we need, but have a really strong detail orientation, puzzle-solving skills, pattern recognition, hyper-focus, and tech technical um, uh, capability, or strong technical skills. And I'd read about a program in Israel where a number of, they have a neurodiverse population, those on the autism spectrum, in Israel, just like anywhere else, like we have here. And they were deploying a lot of those um, enlistees when they were coming into the other two years of military service into the cybersecurity battalions. Because they were looking for folks who could be very detail-oriented, pattern recognition, puzzle-solving, technical capability, and look through lines and lines of code to find vulnerabilities, gaps, errors in, in, in the computer code that may be a cyber vulnerability or something to exploit. I'm like, well, data labeling, very similar. Go through lots of information, be technically proficient, detail-oriented, pattern recognition, all those kind of things. And unfortunately, for the rest of the country, but fortunately for us, they're an underemployed available population. So we created the company Enable Intelligence, and that was what we do. So over half of our uh, staff are neurodiverse, also have neurotypical employees and military veterans. And we go through things like satellite imagery, uh, electro-optical SAR, hyperspectral, whatever it may be, other types of data, and annotate it to create very precise and highly accurate and reliable AI models for the government and other sort of high critical mission, sorry, sort of uh, industries like medical care, financial services, and the like. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah, I know uh, the workforce and maintaining a really high talent pool has been has been a struggle for a lot of people. It's it's a great solution for it. It hits on a lot of points. Um, so, can you dive a little bit more into the hyperspectral imagery labeling that you've been doing? Sure. So, hyperspectral is a, a quite a promising new, well, not new, but a quite a promising. Um, additional capability in terms of especially geospatial data. Um, you can use hyperspectral imagery to find leaks in methane lines and gas lines for oil and gas industry. You can use it for um, looking at reef health or environmental impacts, agricultural purposes. And the government, of course, has a number of uses, everything from what I just talked about for NOAA and Department of Agriculture, to some unique military and intelligence use cases for DOD. But hyperspectral data is very complex. So think of a typical like Google Maps image, that's one one um, visual spectrum that we're seeing that's being portrayed in that image. A hyperspectral image may have 220 of those bands stacked all the way from ultraviolet to infrared and everything in between and non-visible spectrum. And you can use that, uh, but it takes a lot of expertise. And as more hyperspectral sensors have moved from being handheld or just flying over in low, low altitude, now there's companies like Pixel and Orbital Sidekick and of course the, the government who've put hyperspectral sensors and imagers up in space. 
Well, the difficulty of ana analyzing not only 220 bands, but from 430 to 450 kilometers in space is a really difficult data challenge. And you need AI to help. So we started a program with the Air Force, also working with places like NGA and others. Pixel has been a partner um, to see how can we label an hyperspectral satellite imagery? And then how can we label it to create reliable AI tools to help analysts go through terabytes of imagery that took, takes specialized chemists to review and bring that down to the typical analyst to be able to look for things. So we were able to identify one of the programs that was featured here today, at the, not today, but here at the conference, um, was uh, the identification of lithium mines and lithium pools around the world using hyperspectral imagery to do that using an AI. Um, we use some pixel imagery, some government imagery, and then our own um, labeling of those things, and then AI to identify those uh, those types of uh, elements. Okay. That's awesome. I mean, you just touched on now some of the things you've seen in the conference so far. Is there anything in particular that you were hoping to get out of being here at GeoWint today, or this year? What I really liked about um, GeoWint this year, and I think the focus in the industry and government writ large, is you, for a long time it was, there was a democratization or delivery of pixels, right? Um, Satellite imagery was something only governments or NASA could do um, or DOD could do. And now there's lots of great companies delivering satellite imagery and geospatial uh, data in many different ways. Um, but it was delivery of pixels. And now I think we're moving to the delivery of analysis. So it's one thing to say, here's pictures of every seaport in Asia. Well, now we want to know how many ships are there. Where are they going? Um, what kind of uh, material are they delivering? What kind of cargo do they have? How are the sea lanes doing? Fish quantities, all these types of things. Now it's moved like, instead of being a wash in pixels, we want to help people be able to get directly to analysis. And I think that leap is starting here, and we can see some of that with a lot of the vendors out on the GeoWind today. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's headed in the right direction. So for you guys headed into the next couple of years, what are you looking to try to expand to now? So we've just really scratched the surface on this need for data labeling uh, and annotation. Uh, we've been growing very fast. Um, and in fact, we just announced a partnership with a local nonprofit in the DC area called Melwood, where we're training 100 new geospatial data annotators and analysts, uh, mostly from the neurodiverse community uh, locally. Um, and that's only scratching like half of our need in terms of people in the next 10 months. So we're looking to expand across that again but more so, on top of the high quality data labeling that we're doing, we have started building AI models and developing AI and analytical tools, software, from this data that we're analyzing for our customers, including the government. Um, and so we've really started expanding, like I said, from that, a little bit from that, let's look and find all the airplanes to let's provide the analysis that finds it for, you know, make the AI tools that are reliable. Going forward. So we're also expanding in our data science areas as well. Awesome. Great. Well, good to hear. So as we wrap up now, um, is there any last points that you'd like to get uh, you know, the message out to the people? I just think it's a very exciting time, uh, especially for geospatial intelligence, geospatial analysts. The melding now, I think it's a much more solid combination of commercial and government needs. Um, and we're unlocking untapped resources and workforce, as you talked about, that have been maybe overlooked or forgotten about, but it bring unbelievable like superpowers specifically to this need and we're unlocking those and we can see the the fruits of that and that's been pretty exciting to see awesome well, good to hear thanks for uh, talking to us peter sure thing i'm joe calamari here at project geospatial we'll see everybody next time